All right, we're going to be talking about automotive systems today. It's a way in which we're going to take a car, which is very, very complex, many miles of wire and many, many parts, and we're going to break it up into five, basically, um, groups of components and etc. So that we can begin to look at this car with all those parts and miles of wire, etc., and computers, and look at it in five distinct areas and then kind of break those areas down into subgroups. So those five areas are going to be first the body, frame, and chassis, and we'll talk about each of these groups in the ensuing slides. Body, frame, chassis, the engine itself that propels the car, the drivetrain, which includes transmissions, drive shafts, drive axles, etc. Uh, the electrical system, which is all of the computers and all the electrical components, electrical and electronic. We'll talk about the difference. And then all the accessories, which are usually are electrically operated on modern cars, didn't always used to be on all cars. So let's talk about these five um, groups. So first, the body frame chassis. So the body frame chassis is this pretty part of the car here on this Dodge Viper coupe. Um, that's the body. Um, it's usually a light gauge steel. Some cars have fiberglass panels and some cars have aluminum panels like the new Ford F-150. The doors and the cab are all aluminum. Uh, the bed um, is still steel. They drop 500 pounds off the car by going from steel to aluminum. Some cars have carbon fiber parts, which is very expensive, but very, very strong and light. Okay, So the body is that outer shell, the pretty part, the woo-wow part, the part we like that looks pretty. Okay. Um, secondly is the frame. The vehicle structure, the solid part of the vehicle is the vehicle structure, or I call it the backbone of the car. Um, not all cars have a full frame. The, this vehicle here, which is actually a race car, is a modified full frame. So you can see the big steel channel frame coming down both sides and a bunch of cross pieces all boxed uh, they're in a square that makes them very very strong typically trucks are going to have uh, full frames because they need lots of strength to hold weight and uh, etc most modern smaller cars are going to be what we call unibody construction we'll look at that in a moment but this is a, a frame and so it's the the car has some sort of strong structure for all the heavy components like the engine and the transmission to bolt to. So the um, next part of this, the third subset of body frame chassis is the suspension. And the suspension is all of those components that we've got in blue up here that hold the car up off the road and give it some ride comfort. So you've got springs to give us cush as we go over uh, bumps. We've got uh, bars like this sway bar to kind of control what we call body roll, which when we go around a corner, the body tends to roll. Okay, um, they're highlighting the brakes, but it's the suspension parts of the spring, the shock inside there that dampens spring oscillations, this lower control arm, this sway bar, etc. Those are all the suspension components. They're going to suspend the car, hold it up off the road, and provide some ride comfort. Then we have a steering system that gives you the ability as a driver to provide some sort of directional control. So this Acura steering wheel, you can see it. It's got all kinds of controls on it, cruise control and stereo controls and other types of media controls. But this steering wheel gives you, uh, the driver, directional stability control or directional control. You point the car where it's going to go. The fifth subset is our brakes. So here's our braking system here that's going to be used to stop the car that is a aftermarket front disc brake setup that you're seeing there and I can tell it's an aftermarket high performance because of all these holes drilled in the rotor which tend to cool it but this is an aftermarket front disc brake um, setup that you're looking at there I'm going to push this back just a hair get a little more of that into the camera there okay so we have the body that pretty part, we've got the frame, we've got the suspension to hold it up off the ground, we've got the steering to give us directional control, and we've got brakes to stop the car, okay? And all brakes on all passenger cars and light duty and uh, trucks are all what we call hydraulic brakes, meaning when you push the pedal, you're moving a liquid through lines to a disc brake caliper or a drum brake wheel cylinder. Um, which we'll talk about later in the trimester, and all of those are used to apply the brakes. Uh, medium and heavy-duty trucks use air brakes. Okay, they're going to use air 
to actually stop the vehicle. So we'll talk about that. So in a liquid system is a hydraulic system. An air system is a pneumatic system. Pneumatic is spelled P-N-E-U. It just starts with a P, pneumatic. So the second major group on the vehicle is the engine. And so the engine right here behind me, this Chevrolet V8, is a mechanical device that's going to take chemical energy, gasoline and air, or diesel and air, and turn it into a mechanical energy. We're going to convert a chemical into a mechanical motion, if you will. So the whole goal is explode air and fuel and push a device down that we call a piston and spin a crankshaft. And we'll talk about all of that later. Um, I, I did already show you that animation, um, but I'll, I'll be showing you more about that later. So secondly, we have a cooling system to dissipate engine heat. So um, when we dissipate engine heat, the heat is from combustion. So when we burn the air and fuel, we're going to make right around 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit of heat. And that heat can really melt and damage engine parts if we don't cool it. So we have a cooling system. So here's a radiator here, which is a heat exchanger. It has a liquid coolant that goes through it, gets cooled, and gets pumped back to the engine. So we want to dissipate some of that combustion chamber energy. Um, third, with this mechanical system working so fast and the, all the heat that's involved, we've got to have a lubrication system. We've got to have oil and components that pressurize the oil to lubricate all of the engine parts. So it's critical that we have oil to lubricate, for example, a crankshaft, which I'm going to pull up on the bench right now. So here's a crankshaft. I'm going to uh, show you here on the table. And this crankshaft right here is that spinning uh, device, that rotational device that's going to cause the reciprocating motion of a piston to be turned into the rotary motion of the crankshaft and then eventually the spinning wheels. I'll grab the piston with the connecting rod out to show you what they look like. And um, here's a couple of piston and connecting rods here on the bench that we can show you. This piston and this connecting rod are what's going to cause the explosion. I'll pause right now, and what I'm going to do is pull up the animation that I can show you of the crankshaft spinning, and so you can kind of see the, the dynamics of all of this. So give me just a moment, and I'll pull it up. So here we go. One sec. So what you've got in front of you here is a four-cylinder inline engine that is... Um, that is um, running around there and um, you can see these are one, two, three, four pistons spinning this crankshaft. You've got what's called a flywheel here. Two camshaft opening the valve, springs closing it, chain connecting crankshaft to camshaft. Here comes the piston and the piston is going to draw in air and fuel, compress it, get a spark, explode, exhaust it. Draw in air and fuel, compress it, ignite it, exhaust it. Draw in air and fuel, compress it, ignite it, exhaust it. So when you get the ignition from that spark, it forces that piston down. At freeway speeds at 3,000 revolutions per minute, when you're going about 70 miles an hour, roughly, this piston is going up and down at 50 times a second. So 50 times a second at freeway speeds, tremendous friction uh, would you would have between the piston, piston rings and the cylinder wall if we didn't have oil lubricating those components. And for the crankshaft that's further down, um, you would have real, really a hard time seeing that crankshaft survive as it's spinning that fast at 50 times a second if the attachment points where the connecting rod attaches right there where the bearings are weren't pressurized uh, with uh, lubricating oil. So obviously when you see this, you go, well, I guess uh, oil is super, super important. Yes, it is. And to keep it clean, it's super important because it's got to lubricate all of these components. So we're going to be talking about these components more in depth, what they are, how they work, how the four-stroke cycle works, 
what are the chemicals involved, what is the pollution involved, and what are the forces involved further. So our next subset under engine, our fourth subset under the engine is the electrical system. So we have um, we have electric electricity that's going to power, my abbreviation here, PWR for power, provide electrical power to start the engine with the starter motor, to charge the the um, battery with an alternator and to power all the accessories. So kind of the heart and soul of the charging system is the the um, alternator there. I'm going to move this back just a little bit. Is the alternator there. I don't have a starter motor in the picture, but there is an alternator that's used to charge everything. So the fourth subset of an engine is the electrical system. Next, the fifth subset of the engine is fuel system. So the fuel system is used to deliver fuel with air into the combustion chamber to be ignited and then to explode and then to push the piston down. So what you've got here in the picture is a couple of uh, fuel injectors for an indirect injected engine. Most engines from about 2010 and maybe some cars a little earlier forward have direct injection, although many cars today have both direct injection and indirect injection. I'll show you what those injectors look like. So here I have a set of six indirect injectors, six nozzles. And if you look really close up there, if I can get it to focus on it. It might focus if I put my hand like that. Let me get it right up there. Put that one right there. You know, I can't get, there's little tiny holes down in there. Maybe if I put my hand behind it, you'll, yep, you can see the holes. See little holes way down in that nozzle? I'm going to go ahead and put that nozzle right there. Hopefully I can get it to focus on it. Okay, I'm having trouble getting to focus again. There it is. There's the little holes down in there. They're pretty hard to see. So that's an indirect injector. Here's a... Let me get in front of it and get it to focus on me. Okay, so sometimes this thing has trouble focusing. So here is a diesel injector, but it's this is um in, in a direct injector, and a, and a gasoline one would look fairly sim similar. This Mercedes direct injection diesel injector pressurizes at about 10,000 psi. That's pounds per square inch. Um, a gasoline direct injector sprays at a roughly 1,800 to 2,000 pounds per square inch. These indirect injectors spray at about 35 to 40 PSI. Okay. So the next subset of the engine is the ignition system. And the ignition system is that system that's going to provide a high energy spark or high voltage spark to jump the gap on the electrode. And this is kind of a computer animation. It really looks more like this. You can see the little spark there between the center and side electrode. And that spark is going to ignite that air and fuel that's compressed by the piston going up on what's called the compression stroke into a very, very flammable, high pressure um, uh, mixture that gets ignited by the spark, explodes, and pushes that piston down. So we have to have an ignition system to do that. The next subset of the emission control system is a system that eliminates uh, pollution. We call it, well, we call them emission control systems, and they eliminate pollution. There's all kinds of de devices on cars to eliminate pollution. We used to have about six to eight devices on every car in the 80s and 90s, and now in the new millennium, we have more like five or six. Some cars as little as four, but four to six, five to six emission control devices. The way we are metering, that is regulating air and fuel into the engine, has made the engine a lot um, cleaner burning, so we don't have to have as many after combustion uh, treating it, um, types of systems. So um, we have things like a catalytic converter, and this catalytic converter is used to convert uh, unburned hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide into H2O and CO2. Um, we look at CO2 just, if we're producing a lot of CO2 out the tailpipe of a car, we're happy because that means we're oxidizing our carbon monoxide and our hydrocarbons and making H2O and CO2. Um, CO2 being considered a greenhouse gas and potentially hurting the environment. Well, that's another issue altogether. But as far as running uh, gas 
and diesel vehicles, we're going to make CO2. And the more we make, um, we usually uh, look at it as a more efficient running engine and a cleaner engine. Um, but then, you know, again, if we don't want to make CO2 because of our concerns about uh, being a greenhouse gas, then we're going to have to get away from burning fossil fuels at all. What I'd like to do at this point is show you a video on how emission control systems work or specifically how a catalytic converter works. So let me pull it up here. We'll start that again. One second. Right, so okay, here we go. We're going to try that again. A multitude of cars. In each one, a motor burns fuel and produces toxic gases, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide, and unburnt fuel residue. Luckily, each car also has a catalytic converter. Located under the hood, attached to the motor right before the exhaust system. Gases produced by the motor go straight into the catalytic converter and come out the other side less than a tenth of a second later. The converter gets less than a tenth of a second to recombine toxic gas molecules and produce harmless substances like water vapor and oxygen. How? To understand it, we've got to destroy it. The stainless steel housing contains two ceramic blocks. Each block is filled with thousands of micro ducts. Their sides are coated with precious metals. Precious? Platinum and rhodium in the first block. Platinum and palladium in the second block. Metals that can cost more than $100,000 a pound. But they're worth every penny. Together, they have the extraordinary property of causing toxic gases to react and then recombine, producing gases that are harmless to your health. All that without altering themselves or rusting. Precious. The trick is to maximize the contact zone between gas and metals. That's why there are so many micro ducts, almost 400 per square inch. Their combined surface area matches that of a football field. A laboratory as big as a football field, but folded onto itself in order to remain small. The transformation of gas from toxic to non-toxic happens most efficiently when the catalytic converter is hot. Very hot. 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the toxic gases themselves that heat up the catalytic converter. They exit the motor at temperatures as high as 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The chemical reactions inside the catalytic converter also generate heat, transforming the converter into a super efficient furnace designed to break down and reform gas molecules. Let's take a closer look at these mysterious transformations. The nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide molecules, along with the molecules of unburnt fuel residue, enter the catalytic converter. They're swallowed up by the thousands of microducts. As they reach the platinum and rhodium in the first block, nitrogen oxide molecules are the first to react. These metals break down the molecules by withholding one of their atoms. The freed atoms stick to each other and recombine. The result? Nitrogen oxide molecules become oxygen and nitrogen, which already make up 99% of the air that we breathe. The gas molecules now head into the second block, where the microducts are coated in platinum and palladium. These precious metals withhold oxygen. The intense heat here forces the carbon monoxide molecules to combine with the oxygen. The result? Carbon dioxide. The same gas that creates bubbles in soft drinks. Now for the molecules of unburnt fuel residue. At these extreme temperatures, their encounter with the oxygen forces them to recombine. The result? More carbon dioxide and water. All that in less than a tenth of a second. In theory, the catalytic converter can eliminate 99% of a motor's toxic gases. In reality, it's inefficient as long as it's not hot. 
A car has to travel about six miles before the catalytic converter reaches its ideal operating temperature. That's six miles spewing untreated gases. In spite of the catalytic converter's best efforts, the car remains a source of pollution. But thanks to this miniature laboratory, it emits five times less pollution. That's still pretty impressive. Okay, so that was a pretty decent um, presentation of a catalytic converter and how it works and um, what it can do. And um, But basically, we're converting. We do a reduction reaction in the front. We do an oxidation reaction in the back. The reduction, we strip oxygen off nitrogen. In the back, we combine oxygen with hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide to make H2O and CO2. So the next subset, and that's just, by the way, the catalytic converter is just one emission control device. Every car since about um, 1974 has a catalytic converter. So we got rid of tetraethyl lead in gasoline back in the early mid-70s because tetraethyl lead ruins a catalytic converter, so we had to go to unleaded gasoline. So our next subset of an engine is a computer control system. So the computer control system consists of what we call a PCM. Oh, went a little too fast. A PCM, which is a computer, powertrain control module, is an engine computer. Um, and transmission computers and ABS computers and airbag computers, etc. But all these computers work together with different sensors to give certain commands to fuel injectors, to emission control devices, to the spark, etc. Um, but we have computer controls controlling many, many of the subsets of an engine. So, for example, a modern expensive BMW or Mercedes can have anywhere from 125 on up uh, computers on board. So. 125 computers on board. They're all talking. We call that multiplexing, sharing information. And we'll talk about those more in depth in a, in a more advanced class. The third subset of an engine is called the drivetrain, or the third main, sorry, I said that wrong, not of the engine. The third main heading or category of a vehicle is the drivetrain. So the drivetrain is all of those parts, uh, like it says on there on the screen, that transfer motion. From the back of the engine all the way to the wheels, so that's going to include a transmission. And here's an um, automatic transmission here and a in the innards of a uh, manual transmission here, etc. So first transmissions, again, automatic and manual. This one's been cut open so you can look into it. This one, the, the, the inner gears and shafts have been taken out of the case so you can see it. When you look at these gears, in some ways they'll, they might be a little more familiar looking because you've seen gears on a bike, for example, though the gears are shaped differently. This automatic transmission looks quite a bit different than probably anything you've seen, uh, etc. In our chassis and drivetrain systems classes, we look at both of these transmissions in depth and talk about them and service them and all those kinds of things. Next, our second subset of drivetrain is what we call a drive shaft. A drive shaft like this one here is about a five to six foot long steel or aluminum tubing that transfers motion from the transmission back to a differential. Now, I do have a drive shaft here in the room. I'm going to show you an aluminum one in a moment. I do not have a drive shaft or differential here in the, um, uh, in the classroom because it's too large. So I'm going to show you a drive shaft, and then we're going to pause, drag the computer out to the shop, and I'll show you some of these components. So hang on just one sec. So I'm going to walk over here. And behind these two engines that I have, I've got an aluminum drive shaft. I'll pull this engine out. And there's an aluminum drive shaft there on the ground for a Ford van. And it's quite long, all the way back there to all the way over there. Really, really long on that Ford van. Let me pause the camera, and we'll go out to the classroom. for. So I said we're going to continue out in the classroom. And we're actually continuing out here in the shop. And I know I'm not seeing myself, but I'm pointing the camera down so you can see this drive shaft. So this is a drive shaft out of a 2005 Toyota Tundra. It's a two-piece drive shaft, so it bolts together right here in the center. I've got it unbolted because this is called a center support bearing here. And this one, you can see, was damaged. This guy was all broken up inside there. And I just replaced this today. But anyways. Um, with these four bolts here, I'm going to bolt this back together. But that's a drive shaft, and it's got what's called U-joints. This joint here, a compound U-joint here, and another one back here. And what these U-joints allow is, as this thing is spinning, 
they allow for angular change so that as the car is going up and down and the wheels fall in holes, this can be spinning to transfer, transfer mo motion from the back of the transmission to the differential, and yet it can change angle. All of you remember as a little kid, you're in the back of your parents' car and you're going down the road and, and um, you saw it like a truck and you looked alongside and you, underneath you saw this big, long tubular shaft spinning and you were like, wow, what is that thing? That's a drive shaft. It's transferring the motion, spinning motion from the engine and transmission back to the differential. Let me pause this and I'll drag it over to a differential. So here we are underneath this 2005 Toyota Tundra that's up on the rack. And this is a differential in here. It's got a series of gears and it's got this long tube. And we're going to talk about it in just a moment. But while we're out here, we're going to talk about it further in the PowerPoint. But while we're out here, we'll take a look at it. So I'll back the camera where you can see it's hooked up to that wheel there and to this wheel here. These are called leaf springs. That's going to uh, hold the car up off the ground. That's what's going to suspend it off the ground. We call those suspension component. This is a shock that dampens out the oscillations or the vibration of that spring. But let's look at this differential more closely for a moment. So here it is on the front side. So that shaft over there on the bench bolts up there to the back of, this is called a transfer case. So this is the transmission here. This is a transfer case here because it transfers motion back to the rear wheels and then forward through another drive shaft to a front differential to drive the front wheels. And where you see those rubber boots there, that's where the axles are. So this is a four-wheel drive vehicle. And that drive shaft on the bench is going to bolt up here and bolt into here. And then it's going to bolt up here. And it's going to spin this differential. Now it's spinning this way, like this. This guy spins like that. And you can see the wheels are going to spin. When I spin this like that, the wheels are going to spin. So we're converting. This differential has gears to convert this rotational motion into this rotational motion. So the purpose of the differential is to change the direction of rotation. It also has some gear reduction. So usually this spins three times for every one wheel revolution, roughly. There are different uh, uh, gear ratios in different differentials. So this is going to change the direction of rotation, give us some gear reduction. Um, and it allows this wheel to spin at a different rate going around a turn than this one. Just like when you're in lane one, you run a shorter distance than the guy in lane six. So if we're turning left, if we're turning this way left, that tire spins slower than this tire. And these gears in here allow that to do that. So that's a differential. While we're under here, this is a full frame vehicle. You can see this big C channel frame here going all the way up and then it gets boxed together up here all the way up to the front where the bumper attaches and on the other side there it goes i'm sorry the brightness might be hard to see it but there's the frame going up there going up there all the way back here to this bar across here that the that the bumper attaches to so everything bolts to that big two-pronged um, frame that has these cross pieces that we call this a ladder type frame. All right, let's pause here. So we'll have more opportunity to talk about frames and unibody and we'll look at them out on the car later, but let's finish up with the differentials. That's going to conclude. Um, we'll make this part one of auto systems. It's getting out to be about a half hour. So we want to um, consolidate this into two or put it into two parts. I shouldn't say consolidate. So the differential that you're seeing here, which looks pretty small on the screen, but you saw this whole assembly out there, changes the direction of rotation from this by the drive shaft to this where the wheels are, one wheel there and one wheel out here. It's just showing the brakes here. Um, we're also going to allow for different wheel speeds like we talked about. Um, this one can spin at a different speed at that one and still be driven. And then it's not showing here, but we do provide some gear reduction uh, for that to be able to this can spin like three times and the wheel will spin once. So we will do one more little part here uh, as part of um, part one. So um, the fourth subset of the drivetrain is axles. So these are rear wheel drive axles and these are front wheel drive axles. They, we can have axles like this on an all wheel drive and modern cars that are all wheel drive will have 
an axle that looks like this, both front and rear. But old school cars, heavy duty passenger cars and trucks had big steel axles that looked like this. And I'll grab some so you can see them for just a moment. So here we go down here on the bench. I've got a rear wheel drive axle of a passenger car or truck there. And you can see the studs down there where the wheel bolts too. And then here's a Subaru front wheel drive axle. So this goes across the front of the car, bolts in to the trainer or splines and, and actually pins into the transmission. And then on this side, it's bolted into the, ax the uh, wheel hub and the wheel spins around this driving the wheel. So this one can be used for both front wheel drive and rear wheel drive vehicles. This is strictly rear wheel drive vehicles. Um, so a modern Chevrolet, you know, Yukon or something like that might have one of these axles in the rear for the rear wheels and might have these in the front for the front wheels. That's possible. So anyways, those are axles and they're just a driving member that gets you from transmission slash differential to the actual wheels themselves. Okay. Next, um, this just says RWD because those are rear wheel drive, RWD for rear wheel drive. And these are FWD, which is for front wheel drive, FWD. If we were to say 4WD, that would be four wheel drive. So we'll talk about that in a moment or in the beginning of part two. But rear wheel drive axles, front wheel drive axles, and our fifth and final category on drivetrain uh, in terms of components is our wheels and tires. And um, typically they are made of steel or aluminum. And I'll show you a couple here. I've got a couple here. So here is a aluminum wheel right here. And um, aluminum tends to be, it's lighter than steel. Um, when we manufacture it, it's often, we're able to control its uh, weight around the circumference. So it's more true and more easily balanced. Here is a steel wheel, old school, uh, four lug steel wheel there. So that's um, just a sheet, or, or not a sheet, but a stamped steel, and that's an aluminum one. If somebody says, I have billet aluminum wheels, that means they've got wheels that are um, that are made, machined out of one hunk of aluminum, and they tend to be very, very symmetrical and very, very evenly balanced, and so their ride on the road is super, super smooth, etc. and of course, they're expensive, so you don't want to hit curbs with them. All right, that's the end of part one. We'll take up in part two of auto systems in just a, a little bit.